Year in review for 2022. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The Cranky Cameraman. My name's David. I'm an independent director of photography specializing in media production for business and broadcast. I've been in the business now for this year. Closing out marks my 24th year working full-time in production. Almost all of that has been behind the camera as an operator, cinematographer, news photog. Uh, I've also done some editing. I did a bunch of directing in my time in California, uh, but I just prefer being the cameraman. So the first item up were the Aperture 300D. I acquired two of those. I think I waited till about mid-year to buy them. I think it was like July or August. I went with the straight daylight version, gold mount for the batteries. And the first several outings with those two lights were doing uh, network news stand-ups. So just, you know, like a waist up or tighter close-up shot of a correspondent out in the field. I only used those apertures when I was in direct sunlight and I tried to always set up the easy up if we had enough time to cut the direct sunlight. And then basically I'm just trying to put enough level into the correspondent's face to match the sunlit background the intensity level that I ran those lights at in direct sunlight. But as I recall, it was about 50 to 75% on the dimmer and spotted in like halfway. And then the distance was probably six feet away from the subject. Now those are not common from what I've seen in the field for uh, broadcast news photography. Uh, the most common item you see with live shots are the aperture, uh, no, excuse me, light panel, 6X, one by, panels, what are they called? Light panel, yeah, the light panel. And I actually own two of those in my kit that I keep back in Los Angeles, which is a mirror package with two PL zooms, small audio kit, small interview light kit. And uh, I'm not a big fan of those things. Like I don't particularly like the quality of the light that emits out of them. And then the yoke and the power supply mount is just kind of bulky and awkward. So I prefer my little disposable newer panels that are like 150 US dollars a piece that I've modified to gold mount and you, I buy them off of Amazon. I've ordered those on the road and had them just Amazon Prime directly to hotels. I like those because they have a much smaller footprint for airline. They fit in my tool chest drawers in my van. And they're same, I'm using them right now. I've got one on each side of me and they're dimmed just a touch up from minimum in daylight only. And as you've seen in my channel, those are my go-to panels, just like raw, I don't have any additional diffusion on them right now for my tired face. So the aperture is filled in the void where these things are not bright enough in direct sun, obviously. And then I have my two two by one Gemini panels. I purchased those when they first came out. I think it was maybe 2017. Those also live in my truck. They're kind of big and bulky. And in direct sun, they're not quite bright enough. Third project with the 300Ds was I shot a segment for a 30 minute docudrama that runs on a US cable channel. This series has been on the air for over 20 years. Um, it's like dramatization and interviews, crime oriented stuff. I was all NDA and buttoned up, so I can't uh, tell you who the show is or what it was, but major US cable program. For different interviews, I had the apertures out there either bouncing off of a white card, or I also had barn doors on to create little um, slashes of motivating sunlight in the background. Not very theatrical, just like subtle little gradients. And we were all like 2.0 aperture or 2.8 and it was off in the distance, so fuzzy soft. So even like a hard cut with the doors would render in the show as soft gradients. They work perfect for that. And same thing, I think I run the, those really low, just like every other time I've used them. I don't think I've ever had them at 100% so far. So those are on the truck. Now I could pick up a bunch of little a la carte rentals on those units because they're so popular. But at this point in my career, like I don't want to hustle that hard to make a hundred, two hundred dollars. Like I could put them up on ShareGrid, but my experience with that uh, website in particular is it's usually weekend rentals and it's last minute. So like Friday afternoons, you get calls for rentals and we're usually heading out of town, got family plans on the weekends and I've burned myself in the past where like I'm waiting around to hand off a follow focus for a $65 rental and it screws up my weekend plan. So anyway, I'm happy with those things. They don't need to be profitable for me. They're just uh, a problem solver that's on the truck to make my days easier. Interesting note too is I haven't purchased any modifiers for those units. I thought right away I would get a couple parabolic reflectors like a, a big one and a small one and maybe one of the like, um, 
It's called China Ball modifier, the kind of, you know, your standard light you put over a pool table when you have a, a scene or a group of people playing pool and hasn't come up, so I haven't acquired them. Next up is, I talked about these Manfrotto boom pole stands. Two purposes for those, I wanted a purpose-built mic holder for your standard sit-down interviews for corporate and documentary. I've been using a kit lull stand with a, a proper boom pole and then like a mini grip head with a fish pole holder. And you know, it's a bunch of items versus one purpose-built thing. So when I'm working off of my van now for the whole year, I've used that Manfrotto stand. And just when I go airline mode, or if I gotta jump in someone else's vehicle, like some of this new stuff I had to ride around in the, the Networks SUV, then I may just switch back to the little boom pole kit stand, cause then I can handhold it or do it for like a, a live shot. Last item, which was the big ticket purchase, first quarter of this year was a proper professional audio kit. Same, you can click through my past videos and check that out. Uh, I'm using that about as much as I expected. It has not paid for itself, just like the aperture lights, but it, that again is not my intention with it. It was just to solve problems when I'm in a small market and there isn't a local sound person available, which I've run into quite a bit here in South Texas, or it's package rate legacy clients where I need a higher end audio kit, but the budget's not there to bring in a pro from uh, Austin, Houston, Dallas, you know, their full standard day rate with kit plus mileage and travel versus uh, if I can just have someone local run the kit for me and I can train them up. You know, most of the stuff I do, it's a live shot or it's a one or two person mic'd interview in a static environment almost always or I got to pin a couple of wireless labs on and do like walk and talks. So in all of those cases, I've got enough experience over the years opping a camera while monitoring audio that I'm confident I can like hand the mixer off to someone that I've hired and trained up, but I'll also can monitor and uh, with a set of cans, make sure everything's good. And then I've gone out on a few jobs as the location sound technician. That's been fun. You know, it's something I've kind of tossed around the idea in the past. A few of the long time sound recorders I've worked with for 20 years, um, two in particular started as camera ops. And then as they got older, and they started having back and shoulder problems. They're like, you know, this sound thing looks pretty good. I can bring my own chair. And then uh, on a commercial, if there's active boom operating, I have a second person. I can hire someone younger and fit to hold that thing at full extension, sit at my cart, mix the show. So I added a Sackler tripod to my inventory. I've got a Sackler 20 plus carbon fiber sticks with the ball head with my Amira package in California. And then here in Texas, I have a Sockler 18 SB, a 15 SB, and this year I added a 12 SB, all ground spreaders, all carbon fiber, except for one of my heads is um, aluminum. I think it's the 15. So I added that because I've been doing these three camera shoots here in Texas, and I have got some like flimsier, lighter weight, inexpensive heads, like my Liebeck tripod that's pretty worn out. And last couple shoots, I was putting the Amira as a lock off two shot on that Liebeck head. The camera's way too heavy for that tripod. And uh, just a, I'm just asking for trouble. So anyway, happy to have that. And now it's nice having a, a head that's a little bit smaller. Although, you know what, I think the, the casting, it's the DV model, not the SP model. It looks like the casting might be the, the same dimensions as my 15 model. The big purchase item that I've wanted to acquire for a year now, the Sony FX3 with a couple of lenses and the newest DJI gimbal, newest Ronin. It's a little bit smaller than the, the one I have now. I was gonna buy that all at once, like a 16 to 35 and a 24 to 70 zoom and E-mount, FX3, batteries, four of the cards, which are different than my FX9s. I forget what those cards are called. That's, uh, yeah, I, I, whatever they are, they're kind of expensive. Anyway, I haven't done that. I would use that thing like every other project if I owned it, but it has not prevented me from booking any work and it hasn't, hasn't cost me anything. So the only reason at this point I would pick it up would be after I do a pro forma with my CPA on taxes, if it's advantageous for me to go spend ten, twelve thousand dollars on camera equipment to save a bit on taxes due, 
then I'll do it. But I think we're good. I've been paying quarterly estimates plus payroll all year, and I think we're right in line. And I overpaid last year, and instead of getting the refund, I applied that forward to this year. So I think I'm going to have a surplus again this year. So yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to buy it again until, until I need it. So maybe first quarter or even second quarter. So I spent many years building up my PL cinema lens inventory. I bought those red primes, all six of them, when they, in like the first year they were out on the market. But they were a good purchase. I'm using them less and less, but I've used them for several projects this year. But again, the trend in work I'm doing now is everything's going autofocus on the FX9s. That eye tracker thing is awesome. It's tracking my eye right now. So I need to pick up a few more E-mount lenses. After working on the commercial in San Francisco this year with uh, Adam in SF, maybe Adam, if you're watching this, you can comment below, but he's got a beautiful set of the Sony E-mount primes and zooms in a Pelican they like, it looks like when you look at that Pelican, you would think it would only have half the quantity of lenses that are actually in there. Like he's got it so dialed, small footprint. And then they've got these like press fit Delrin gears that are custom machine for each G series lens. And then they have magnetic lens caps and uniform front shades. So when you're running a matte box, you don't have to change donuts or adapter sizes. You can run through the whole set of primes. So I want to recreate what Adam put together, but I'm going to do it one lens at a time. So the next most common prime that I need shooting full frame is an 85. So I think when I buy the FX3, I'm going to get a 24 to 70 and maybe the 85 prime at the same time. And then after a couple months, when I get a, hopefully a little surplus of funds, I'll add the 35 and then the 25 or 24. I'm not sure which it is and maybe the 135, but I don't know if I'm necessarily gonna buy anything wider than 25. I found with my, my red primes, the 18 is like a almost never, and if I need to go wide, wider than 25, I can always go back to one of my zooms. So I've been covering the US-Mexico border intermittently freelance for over a year now, and I do all the live shots on my FX9, and that's been a bit of a challenge. I, I run it in either 5K or 4K crop mode, and mostly with my 17 to 120 Canon zoom, which only covers a little bit more than Super 35. It covers 5K. I get a tick of vignetting at 17, 18, but once I push past like 18, you don't see any of it. And it's not really objectionable even at 17. It just gets a little darker in the corners. Sometimes it's a nice little, you know, uh, I don't know, artistic contribution. It looks nice on those wide vistas of uh, open space. But uh, the challenge is, even at Super 35, if I'm shooting news and a live shot, we're generally talking about what's going on in the background. And I found even out in the sunlight, if I, I gotta stop down to like an eight or an eight eleven split to have some discernible background. It's still out of focus and shallow, but like I get opened up more than an eight and it's like just too fuzzy. Like sometimes I had a few of them like, ah, it kind of looks like green screen. It doesn't look like we're out in the field. So if I'm gonna do more network news, I need to pick up a traditional ENG camera. I don't think, I'd love to buy a two thirds inch servo zoom camera, but I'm just not doing enough of it really to justify it. So I've been looking at this little Sony camcorder. It's got like a 20 to one zoom. And when you run it in HD mode, I think it's when you, it's. 12 to one optical zoom, and then it's got like the digital push that's seamless up to 20X when you're in 1080 mode. And if I'm shooting news, I'm always in 1080. So I'm kind of thinking about picking up that camera. It's a one inch sensor, so it's a little bit bigger than two thirds inch. So I still got a little bit of that uh, shallow depth of field thing going. It's gonna be better in low light than a three chip prism camera. And more importantly, it's super small. Like I want something with a telephoto reach so I can go capture news events from afar, like particularly with the border. Like if I've got migrants crossing the river with my 17 to 120, like it's just not enough. Like it's a, what is that? Seven to one magnification range. And your typical two thirds inch news camera has got an 18 or 20 to one zoom range. So like I push in and like my subjects out there, they're like this big head to toe in my frame. And I look at some of the other photogs out there and they're getting like, knee up shots with a 18 to one zoom. So I'm thinking that little 90V, it's, I think it's like 2,600 US dollars. 
Um, and that's just a good item. Oh, it's got Cine Tone, and I think it does, or no, it's got uh, S-Log 3. So I can emulate and mix and match with my FX3s, FX9, FX3s to some extent. Maybe not on the same set in a multicam environment, but like if there's some B-roll that's more advantageous with the little camcorder with the long zoom ratio, I can switch from one of my cinema cameras to that video camera. Uh, so I'd like to have that and it just lives on the truck, assembled like on the shelf, ready to grab and go. I've been debating for over a year now whether or not to acquire a live link unit for sports and news. I'm getting more calls for it. Historically, I'd always have it shipped from the network or like a field producer or the correspondents get their own and I just bring a BNC cable and patch in. But then just like a lot of corporate, uh, like live webcasting type of stuff, I get requests for it. So I don't know. And then the flip of it is like, if I buy that thing, like most of that live link up stuff is last minute, the panic phone call, particularly when it's news, like all hours, get in the car, drive, go, and you're on. I got enough of that in my career. I don't know if I wanna market to encourage more of the insane upside down hour working. Marketing for next year, I don't think I'm gonna do any of it. Same course as this year, I'm gonna basically sit and let the phone ring. I've got enough momentum with producers, agencies, corporate clients that uh, it's just juggling schedule. And in terms of quantity of days worked, like 2017 I think was my peak volume year. And I made the conscious decision in 17 like, I don't wanna do this at, at this volume going forward. I need to ratchet back. Quality over quantity. Now quality doesn't necessarily mean higher rates. I know I'm competitive market rates. I'm curious to hear about your plans and perspective for next year. What kind of gear are you looking at? How are you looking to pivot your business or the type of work you're doing? Are you looking to scale up? Are you happy to just maintain? Did you get crushed the last couple years in, in volume and days on the road and you're looking to do less next year? Uh, let me know where you're at in the comments below. Thanks and see you on the next one.